I'm Steve Brusati. I am a paleontologist. I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh, and my job here is I'm the paleontology consultant for the Jurassic World films. We have a lot of real dinosaurs in these films, and that's my role, helping make sure those dinosaurs are realistic and in line with the science. In this film, there are some pretty harrowing scenes where some of our characters are in a boat, and that boat encounters the Mosasaur. It's not actually a dinosaur. It's a reptile in a different group than the dinosaurs. It's actually more closely related to things like lizards and snakes, but you sometimes do hear people calling it informally a water dinosaur or an ocean dinosaur. These mosasaurs, they really lived all over the world, and some were small, just the size of dolphins, let's say, and others really did get to be very, very large, the size of whales. These mosasaurs, back in the Cretaceous period when they lived, they were predators at the top of the food chain in the ocean. They were filling those same roles today that sharks and killer whales do. What the hell are those? It's rhinosaurs. Spinosaurus first appeared in Jurassic Park 3 and is now making its triumphant return. In the time since Jurassic Park 3 came out, we've actually learned a lot about Spinosaurus. And we now know that this dinosaur, quite unusually for a dinosaur, spent a lot of time in and near the water. The biggest adult Spinosauruses would have been bigger than T-Rex. So we're talking about things that were probably in the vicinity of about 50-ish feet long. I think when you look at this skull here, most people would probably look at it and say it looks like a crocodile, looks like an alligator, and it does. It has a long snout. It has, you know, all of these snarling teeth. Now, it was different than crocodiles. It had a big sail on its back. That would have been the primary difference. So basically, a big old sheet of bone that stuck up from its backbone that would have been covered in muscle and skin. Maybe it was used to help the animal swim, to maneuver in the water. But that's the single biggest way that this animal would have differed from a crocodile, even though that face, that mugshot, looks really crocodilian. This is a titanosaur. These were the very biggest dinosaurs of all and the very biggest animals that have ever lived on the land in the entire history of the Earth. These are kind of funny looking animals when you think about it. They had tiny little heads on really long necks, on really plump bodies with arms and legs that look like Greek columns and then a long, skinny tail. And one of the things we really spent a lot of time talking about was that tail, how long it was, why it had such a long tail, what could it do with its tail? Would it move that tail around? Would it use it as a whip, maybe, to protect itself from predators? We do have evidence from the fossil record that these giant long-necked dinosaurs at least sometimes probably did live in groups. And some of that evidence is from fossilized footprints. We often find lots of those together. And that's a sign a lot of these dinosaurs were living together. <laughs> this is Quetzalcoatlus. And Quetzalcoatlus is not a dinosaur. It's not a bird, but it's a pterosaur and that's the fancy scientific name for the pterodactyls, the flying reptiles that lived overhead of dinosaurs. The most obvious thing about this animal is just how big it is. This whole animal would have been the size of a fighter jet, so we're talking about more than 30 feet across. It is one of the largest animals that has ever flown in the entire history of the Earth. They flew with giant sails of skin that attached to a long, a very long fourth finger of their hand. But they didn't actually weigh very much. They were featherweight creatures, and that's because their bones were ultra light, essentially hollowed out, filled with air, and it's light bones like that that allowed them to fly so well at such gigantic sizes. 
These ones with beaks probably were more like storks today. And storks, they spend a lot of time foraging around, using their beaks to pick at lots of different prey. So that's what we envision these huge pterosaurs doing back when they lived roughly 66 to about 75 million years ago. T-Rex, it deserves all the hyperbole it gets because this was a feat of evolution. This was one of the largest meat-eating animals to ever live on Earth. It was about 13 meters long as an adult, so about 40 feet, give or take. It would have weighed seven or eight tons. It had about 50 teeth, and those teeth were the size and shape of bananas. They were thick, they were sturdy, but they were sharp like steak knives, and T-Rex used those teeth to literally crush through the bones of its prey. And T-Rex was not only a big, bulky, strong dinosaur with bone-crunching jaws. No, it was also a smart dinosaur. So T-Rex had a pretty big brain for a reptilian creature of its size. It had a brain with really big olfactory bulbs. That's the part of the brain that controls the sense of smell. That it had a really long cochlea. And we know from modern animals, the longer the cochlea, the greater range of sounds that animal can hear. So if you put it all together, T-Rex was smart. It had great senses of smell, great senses of hearing. It could also see pretty well. And of course, it was monstrous. It was huge. It was strong and powerful. So it had brawn and brains. And I think it would have been just a dreadful encounter if we were to ever see a T-Rex. Well, this is my little friend called Aquilops. That's the technical name of this dinosaur. And ooh, very cute, like a little puppy. Very endearing. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, this is really something for me because, you know, I've been a paleontologist for a long time now. I study dinosaurs. I study dinosaur bones. And a big part of my job is envisioning what these dinosaurs were like as real animals living hundreds of millions of years ago. And I must say, totally honestly, that holding this aquilobs here is one of the closest times I, I think I've ever really been to feeling like these dinosaurs I know so well are, are real animals, not just dusty old bones. So it's very special to do this. There's really only one good fossil that's ever been found. That's it. That's all we know of this dinosaur. But we do have a good amount of the fossil skull of this dinosaur. So we can tell it was about this size of a small dog. And we know it was a plant eater. It had lots of teeth in his jaws that it used to munch on leaves and stems and twigs and other types of plants. Aquilops is a dinosaur that's not very well known. It's not a household name. It's not one of those iconic dinosaurs. Its cousin, Triceratops, its later bigger cousin, is very famous. And one of the great things about the Jurassic series is you don't only see the T-Rexes in the films, you're also introduced to a lot of other dinosaurs. Dinosaurs that are maybe a little bit more niche, that until they're on that big screen, only paleontologists like me know about. But I'm really excited to see Aquilops make its debut and be introduced to the world in this film. And I think it's very special to bring dinosaurs like this to the big screen. We can see these things as real animals and appreciate them.